gosh, I've never been so much in, in the picture. Let's get you. Ah, oh, Neve. Hi, Neve. Hey, how are you? Hi, how are you? I was just thinking about you the other day. You said one of the things saying about the last Fester gig. Remember in Fox? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, co I couldn't believe it. It was 2006, Michael. I could. Uh, yeah, it was brilliant, wasn't it? Oh. Hello. Hi. I see chest. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi. So, can you hear me? Yep. Chester, how are you? Oh, set up here. Oh, you jump. We're all flooding in. Hello, everybody. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> This is the point at which we would usually mute everybody. I can hear you. A few people have it on mute. There's the mute. I don't see it. Well, you can only see nine people at a time. Hmm. I'm not sure if we can. What can we do? Can we move? See all the other people? Hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. Hmm. Hello. Hello, Hello everybody. everybody. How are you? Hello. 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 Hi. Hi. What's your name? Hello, hello. Hi. Good evening. Hi guys, that's Stefan, I think, there, and Kevin yeah. in Limerick, how are you? You're enjoying the cheese. Hello. 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 Okay, we'll just give it a couple of minutes, folks. It's still The numbers are still crawling up uh, gradually before we... Hello, mm. oh, can they hear me? No, that's for all, all people. That's Judy. Judy. Hmm? That's Judy, it is, yeah. Hi, Judy. Hi, Mary. Hi, Kevin. Hello, Will. Uh, this is Noel McMahon here. I'm under the Melrona Corain. Hello, how are you? Very good, thanks. Uh, this is my wife's computer, so that's why I'm under her name. No problem, no. We know where you are now, Noel. We know how to find you. Hi, <laughs> Noel, neighbor. Who's that? Oh. Liam, Liam and Louise. Oh, hello, Liam. How are you? <laughs> Louise has appeared just now. Oh, William's taking her. Is that William? Hello, William. Yeah. How's it going? How are you? Is that a moustache I see? <laughs> what do you call it? November, is it? November? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, Sarah. Are we... Are we all right? No, I'm just too much of us. Right, you know what? Sure, maybe we'll kick in. <laughs> Hello, Will. How are you? How are you doing? Hi. How are you? You well? Good. No, we're here. Okay. Hey, well, hello, Meg. No. I've just muted you all. In fact, uh, if we were, if, if this was extremely professional, we'd have uh, we'd have started with that. But it's, <laughs> it's actually the best part. I think is the very start when uh, when we hear all the voices and everyone coming in and everyone, and the cheese munching and the bottles opening and the screw caps gone. Uh, you're all really, really welcome. Um, it's 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 great to see you all. It's great to see Chester in there. I saw you in the mix there, Chester. Um, so you're all you're all really really welcome. Uh, firstly, a big welcome to you, Chester, from Adelaide, uh, to all the team at Fev uh, who've been instrumental in putting this together and and uh, and helping us bring Chester directly to you guys. It's uh, it's it's a total privilege. So I think we're really we are all really excited and looking forward to uh, to hearing from him in just a moment. It is half eight, so. We aren't going to uh, linger too long on introductions. Um, we'll get straight into tasting some wine very, very quickly, but very quickly on the housekeeping. Uh, you've, you've heard it before. We'll mute. I'll mute uh, because there's so many of us on the call. Um, but we totally, this is your chance to, to ask Chester Osborne some questions and to engage with them. Um, but because there are so many of us, 
we 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 will have you on mute, uh, but please unmute as you want. Um, after every wine, I think is probably the best way we'll do it. So we'll go through. Um, we'll go through each wine maybe one by one. There are seven for us to cover in the next 75 to 90 minutes or so. Um, and it is already mm -hmm. half eight, so we've uh, we've a few wines to get through, but please unmute yourselves after each wine. We'll, we'll, I suppose we'll uh, we'll take it as it comes and we'll, um, we'll, we'll dive in as we need to and as we see fit. So um, otherwise it's, um, it's the first of our winemaker tasting. So Chester, you're kicking off a winemaker series for us and we have a few other winemakers lined up um, over the course of the next few months and adding more, but we purposely, um, we, we really, really wanted uh, to see if Fev uh, could help us organize you for this evening. And we're absolutely thrilled and delighted that you're able to make it. Um, and, and so, yeah, we're, 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 we're delighted to get, to get in uh, straight away. Hermit Crab is the first wine we're gonna have in just a moment. So if anyone does want to pour, um, please do that while we do this quick intro, fill a glass. Uh, hermit crab, um, get it in there. And I think in terms of, uh, lastly, on the housekeeping, this is being recorded. So you should all know that, that um, we'll record, it'll, the whole the whole evening we'll record and we'll send that out in the next two to three days. Um, so if you don't open all the ones tonight, you can watch that back and um, and watch it as you taste in a couple of, in a, in a couple of days, weeks, whenever you get to it. So forever. Yeah. Forever, forever. <laughs> Download it when you get it and then keep it. Perfect. Um, I just want to say I've I've seen Chester a couple of times. Uh, it's always been a, a must to go to a gig. It's a, and and it's like a gig. It's awesome. He's uh, he's brilliant to listen to. He is a truly sound bloke, and he is one of the best winemakers in the whole world. So it's a real privilege to sit back and listen to him. Um, yeah. So what can I say? He's he's only after getting up and he's he's straight into it. I'm sure. Like he's. <laughs> He's going to be amazing. So uh, look, Chester, take it away. Um, take it away. Now you do. Hello, everybody. How are you? All, uh, hopefully all uh, suffering from uh, sinusilicophobia, the <laughs> fear of an empty glass. Um, it's, uh, Kat, this is a wine I have called Sagrantino, uh, made from Sagrantino and Cinso. And uh, sinusilicophobia is the fear of an empty glass, so uh, um, uh, please start drinking if you haven't already. Um, I had a cat called Booze, whose real name was non-alcoholic Booze. We just called him Booze for short, um, because, uh, well, it just was a better name. And uh, so he suffered from sinusilicophobia, thinking he was called Booze, he could drink Booze, but he wasn't, it was non-alcoholic Booze, so he uh, he wasn't allowed to drink. So. Uh, it's a it's an unfortunate thing that uh, that we wouldn't wish upon anyone really. Um, anyway, uh, maybe I'll uh, give you a little bit of background about Derenberg first of all. My uh, great grandfather bought the vineyard in 1912. He, which we still all uh, use uh, that vineyard to make many of the wines. We've bought uh, quite a few other vineyards uh, back uh, 20 years ago. Uh, gradually, old vine vineyards. Um, but uh, going back to my great grandfather, he was actually a director of Hardy's Wines, treasurer of Hardy's Wines, and director from uh, 1881 until 1912 when he bought the vineyard. So we've been in the wine industry now uh, 140 years in McLaren Vale. Um, my uh, grandfather built the winery in 1927 with uh, with my great grandfather, I suppose, around. I wasn't around, so I can't really tell, but he was alive. Uh, and uh, we still do everything the old fashioned way with submerged cap fermentation, a little uh, uh, five ton fermenters, which are actually filling up right as we speak. There's a heap of reds came in last night and they're, uh, they're filling up uh, right now about probably 30, 20 or 30 fermenters. Um, uh, it's a good crop, so it's probably closer to 30. Uh, and um, but uh, they're all submerged cap, we're all basket pressed. Uh, everything is still quite old fashioned the way that it was set up in those days. Um, and I'll talk more about that as we get into it, what it, what it does to the wines. Um, my uh, father joined the company, well, I suppose he and I started work there as soon as we could walk, really, maybe even before we could walk, I reckon, knowing how my father made me work hard. But uh, um, I, I started work, I remember at seven years old, uh, in the holidays for 10 cents an hour 
and uh, and then uh, I didn't. Re- I don't think I was worth that much money. I think I ate more grapes than I put in the bucket. And uh, so I got a wage rise to uh, 30 cents an hour when I was eight. And I thought, that's actually pretty good money. So I actually did work really pretty much all my holidays uh, through my uh, schooling life. And my, uh, my father would have done the same. In fact, he actually didn't go to school until he was about eight years old. He was just homeschooled. And then he left school when he was about 15. So uh, it was pretty hard times. 1943 was when he uh, returned home and uh, started... Um, uh, making uh, uh, making wine and, and helping out in the winery in the vineyard. Funnily enough, his father, he never saw his father in the winery, which is quite quirky. He said he was always ill, and so he never bothered to go out to the winery. He never saw him do any work, so <laughs> that's interesting. But he must have when he was younger. But uh, so uh, Dad had to do all the work, and, uh, of course, it was war years, so he, um, he, he was called up to go to war, but, uh, but then uh, because his father was ill, he had to stay home. The, um, dad, there was only horses there, so everything was done with horses, uh, no tractors, there was no power, only stationary engines, uh, and my father's still alive, he's still kicking very well, goes to work still twice a day, he's 94 years old now, um, had a good lunch with him uh, yesterday with a journalist, and uh, he's still full of stories, so uh, he, he says to everyone, if you drink as much Daremberg as he has, then you stay young. And uh, and he didn't go grey until he's 70. So, uh, he, in fact, he'd say anyone who's grey, which I noticed there's a few people with a bit of age in the room, he'd say, you're not drinking enough Daremberg, is what he'd be saying. Or if your hair's falling out, he'd say, it's because you're not drinking enough Daremberg. Uh, but um, he, uh, yeah, so... Dad loved the tractor that he got in 1948 and he could bore up and down the rows and kill all the weeds because the the, the uh, horses never could really keep up with uh, cultivating the vineyard so the weeds were everywhere. But he loved cultivating. And then when I came home, I finished a winemaking degree in 1983 and uh, 1984 was my first vintage in control. Dad basically said, well, you're trained now. First trained winemaker we've had. So you uh, you know what you're doing. <laughs> of course, I had no idea what I was doing, really. I'd worked a couple of vintages in the Hunter Valley, and I'd worked for Hardy's uh, at Shadow Ranella in 83 for vintage, and so I had a bit of an idea, and I'd always grown up with it. But I didn't I didn't change any of the equipment because I, I didn't really know what I should change it to. So I just left it the same. Then um, gradually, as I developed, the, the wines that Dad had made through the 60s were amazing, great reputation. Uh, so I went, well, why would we change uh, and change the equipment? So we just built more and more of the same basket presses and fermenters. And, uh, uh, but I did change the vineyards. Um, and uh, one day I said to my father, we're going to give up cultivation, give up herbicides, give up fertilizers, nitrogen fertilizers, and, uh, and uh, uh, really uh, stop, uh, just mow down the rows and that's it to reduce the competition. And, uh, Dad said, uh, oh, there we are. There's the submerged cap ferment. Uh, Dad said to me, oh, we should sell the vineyard before uh, the vines all die so we can get something for it because he thought I was going to kill everything. Um, uh, you know, lower, there's, there's my father in the background there, um, not wearing a safety vest because he's, yeah, well, he said I never had to wear it before. Why would I start wearing it now? Um, and I'm, I'm actually not that good at it. They're supposed to wear steel cap shoes in the winery too, and I still... Uh, have uh, my boaties on <laughs> where you know for sailing but well, anyway um, and um yeah so there's my father again in the basket press in the background and throwing out fermenters so these are the fermenters built in 1927 and uh there are 17 of these and then we have another oh couple of hundred or more actually uh, more than a couple of hundred that are modeled on this that are stainless steel that we can use a forklift to move around and there, there's the basket press as well um, and uh, that's a few years ago. I'm a bit uh, a bit more like looking like my father right now. In fact, actually, we're the same weight, my father and I, right now. I'm not going to say what that is, but uh, but he's he's probably shrunk a bit, and I think I've uh, I've sort of absorbed his uh, his uh, mass. Uh, uh, I think I, I think he's slowed down on drinking, and I've sped up, something like that. I'm not sure. But that that basket press is actually from Yolumba. We bought it in 1960. Free and uh, they want it back, but it's a bit late now. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it was a French cock press built in the 1880s. So uh, anyway, they, they, they haven't got any basket presses left, and we've got another one on behind it that was uh, now about a 90-year-old Australian Bromley Trigoni. And then we built another 
uh, eight presses that uh, that we designed ourselves that to use stainless steel cages and and uh, and other things. Um, look, we we, we should uh, hop into a drink as a, as I mentioned. I think you, as you said, the the hermit crab is your your first wine. I've got a, a crab here to uh, represent that. Um, uh, I did have caricature here somewhere, but I, I, I can't seem to find that. Uh, but I've got some of the other wines here. Um, so now uh, we, back in the, uh, what is it, the 90s, uh, I believed that uh, Marsan, Roussan and Viognier would work extremely well in McLaren Vale because we did great Grenache, Shiraz and Mourvedre. So it just made sense that we did that. And mm -hmm. I spent a fair bit of time in America. They would, there was a lot of the, the Rhone movement happening in America. So I thought, well, we should plant uh, those varieties. There was, of course, the red wine boom, export boom started in 1990. So everyone was planting Shiraz flat out. There's masses of Shiraz going into the McLaren Vale. And we, we thought, uh, the growers were coming up and going, we can't plant more Shiraz. We've got to plant another grape variety. Uh, we want a white. And I said, well, don't plant more Shiraz, no reason, or Sauvignon. Uh, why don't you plant Viognier? So we got uh, all these growers over a few years planted Viognier for me. And I went and... Uh, after yeah, two years, I added up how much Viognier was planted that I told them to plant, uh, and our own vineyards, which were quite extensive. Um, and we had 140 acres of Viognier, and we hadn't actually made a Viognier in McLaren Vale to know whether it worked at this stage. <laughs> so it's a little bit gutsy. Um, and uh, But uh, we were very surprised, or not so surprised, all of them anyway, uh, but that it actually worked really well. And uh, um, so the hermit crab was created. Uh, now, Viognier is a very low vigor variety, so it doesn't, uh, it takes a fair while to get to the wire and along the wire and, uh, and start giving a crop. But Marsan is actually quite a, a faster vigor variety and, and yielded uh, more at the beginning, even though we had a lot less planted, um, about 40 acres, us and our growers. Um, so uh, it was originally a Marsan Viognier. And um, Marsan is the major white grape of Hermitage. And Hermitage translated means house of the hermit. And a hermit crab carries his house around the whole time. So there are hermit crabs as fossils in the, in the limestone oh, and on the beaches, but in the limestone and the sandstone. The roots are down there, suck out little bits of fossilized hermit crab into the grapes and into the wine. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, Marsan um, uh, is a major white grape. Hermitage, uh, house of the hermit. And there you are, we see a, a hermit crab uh, uh, well, a modified hermit crab in a, with a wine bottle instead with fruit all over it. It's a uh, lovely little uh, caricature done by... We, we commissioned 70-odd uh, of the top cartoonists of Australia to draw caricatures of each of the label names, which uh, we actually sell these as well. But and this is a typical blend. They're around 60 or 70% uh, uh, Viognier and uh, yeah, the Marsan there. Now, the Viognier comes from two clones. Uh, a, a very rare clone that came from Chateau Grillet, uh, one of the smallest appellations, if not the smallest white appellation in, uh, in Europe, only about a hectare, uh, in around uh, Condria in the Northern Rhone. And this, uh, this clone is, uh, has a very orange uh, berry uh, uh, and more loose clusters, more uh, longer internodes between the, uh, the leaves. And so th this actually um, uh, produces a wine with a little bit more ginger, a little bit more uh, orange rind characters um, and, and some uh, nuts and things. The other clone is from Montpellier in the, the south of France where, and this is a, a more green berry clone, with smaller clusters, mm -hmm. tighter clusters, much shorter internodes uh, between the leaf leaves. And, and, uh, and uh, it has more nectarine uh, and develops quite a nice apricot-like character. Um, and a bit, bit other blossoms, different blossoms than the orange rind, more of a sort of, I suppose, white peach-like blossoms. Um, we, uh, we ferment about 8% uh, of the Viognier in uh, old French oak, like a 20-year-old French oak. Uh, this is not to give oak character, really, but to give uh, some solids ferment. So I ferment with juice solids in the fermentation. This gives um, 
a uh, uh, more uh, um, uh, sort of, you know, richer character, more complexity. They're wild ferments, so again, uh, more nuttiness. And 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 you know, Viognier can be a little bit sort of unctuous. It has quite a, a strange. Uh, uh, tan and the mouthfeel profile, um, especially when it's really quite ripe, which a lot of them are 14, 15% alcohol in the Rhone. This is only 13 and a half because these vines now are about 25 years old. Then we, we've got um, uh, old material. I'm picking, I like to pick them a little bit earlier so the Viognier is not too strong and has the nice bit of minerality and, and, uh, and better acidity. Uh, and then, and so these are, the oak component is sort of layering other tannins and flavors in there. The marsan is uh, just take fermented, uh, but a lot of the marsan is grown on a gray cracking clay where the roots are down in this cracking clay. Uh, marsan you know, grows very vigorous at the beginning. It looks like it's got eight or 10 tons an acre on there often. And then um, the cracks will form after the berries have set and the berries stay very small as the roots will shatter and there's not much water going up. And it's quite difficult to grow in this geology. In fact, it's not very good for red wine, but it is actually quite good for white wine and uh, for, for, for Marsan particularly. Uh, and it just sits on the vine, just slowly ripening at the last stages. And it gets this really lovely green mango, green papaya, and particularly pistachio nut-like character. Uh, and, and quite full, like the Viondi, quite full, but a different sort of fullness and a different mix of tannins, such that the whole thing sort of comes together as one whole wine uh, and, uh, and not so unctuous, but more uh, seamless, I suppose. And, uh, and this has become our, our biggest selling white wine that we make, which is quite interesting being Viondi uh, dominant, but it's, uh, it's gone extremely well around the world. Um, oh, by the way, anyone got any questions, please, uh, I don't know whether you sing out or whether you uh, write them. What, what was the idea there, Will? Well, we've, we've, so we have a couple of options, Chester. I have said to everyone if they wanted to ask any questions on the chat, they can. Um, but at any point, yeah, at any point here, if anyone does have any questions, talk, please unmute yourself um, and, and, and dive in and ask. While, while we wait, our, our Chester, there's a couple that I am mad keen to ask you. One, one being, you mentioned you picked the Viognier early in order to keep the minerality and the freshness in there, is, is, is part of that process to keep the alcohol level down or is, is that even a factor? No, you, you're definitely right um, because, uh, well, the alcohol level, the higher it gets, the harder the wine gets at the finish, obviously, the hotness and the hardness, which will help cover, unfortunately, cover the minerality and that vibrant, fresh uh, length. So, so yeah, it, it's part of the, they're the same sort of thing in, in a way. Uh, but also the city is going to be a little bit higher and that fresh, flowery length is going to be a bit better. And it, it make, this wine ages really well. It's In fact... I, and uh, this uh, drinking best when it is uh, three years old and, and uh, four or five years old, and, and then you can drink it for ages. But I, you know, that sort of window is, is where it really seems to kick in really beautifully. Uh, oh, I'm not sure what vintage you've got there. I, I'm, got well, I was wrong wondering if you. I was wondering if you said that because we're drinking three-year-old <laughs> but it's 18 it's 18 we have isn't it it's, yeah uh, yeah we're 18 so it's awesome it's awesome I love oh, cool. here. I mean you mentioned mandarin you mentioned uh ginger 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 and it's yeah. really prominent it's really prominent and you're not even drinking it um but, but yeah <laughs> you talk about it enough I'm sure <laughs> Uh, it, it is seven o'clock in the morning here. Uh, actually, I've been up for three hours. I was, I've been designing a new building. We're looking at another business. We're buying and relocating, and I've been and I've been excited about it. So I've been up pretty early this morning. Uh, but uh, so we could have started an hour or two before it then. But anyway, it uh, well, I, I, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure we wouldn't be the first, probably even even today, to ask you about the cube and how in God's name you came up with that and where that concept came from. Uh, and I'm sure of a picture I'll pull up uh, here for. I don't need one. <laughs> well, I, I see uh, someone's got a picture of it in a magazine. There we are. Uh, uh, and uh, I've got a little, there's a nighttime picture I've got here of the Derenberg Cube. There we are uh, in the vineyard. Uh, so, yeah, yeah this has uh, become quite a uh, feature, obviously, at Derenberg, uh, winning a lot of awards and whatever. And uh, we, uh, we have uh, visitations of, well, when we, when we were allowed to have a lot of visitations, about uh, 500,000 people a year visiting. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's like a Rubik's Cube. 
uh, but instead of colours on the outside, they're puzzles on the outside. Um, uh, and it's harder. It's become the Darrenberg cube, of course. We sell the toy. I showed you. Know, I held it up a minute ago. Uh, the idea was that our label names are such a puzzle to work out and wine is such a puzzle to work out. I went, what's the most iconic puzzle? Uh, a Rubik's Cube. So, But we'll make it even better and harder, the Darrenberg cube. So, so that's really where it came about. And it's our tasting room, our uh, restaurant. Uh, there's a lot of art in there. In fact, the, the middle floor is all uh, dedicated to Salvador Dali exhibition. We have uh, uh, 25 sculptures by Salvador Dali. Uh, uh, some of them are worth $3 million or so. Uh, some of them are quite big uh, outside. Um, and um, and a heap of paintings. So it's, uh, that's a really lovely coup to have there. Uh, and then the bottom two stories have uh, mostly my sculptures by myself. I've been, especially during COVID, I've done about two, finished two sculptures a week uh, of uh, made out of junk art uh, that tell the story of, our, of each of our wines. So it's going to come out in a book eventually, which uh, which uh, will co should come out later this year and maybe help celebrate our 110th birthday next year. Um, but, uh, and I've written a science fiction during COVID as well of uh, how we have souls and um, souls uh, creating communications with grapevines and making much better. Well, uh, souls going into... Uh, appliances with computer chips that then start talking to grapevines and then talk, relay that message to the winemaker and, and he makes the unbelievable Grenache and that's what it's called, the unbelievable mm -hmm. Grenache. There's a lot more in it, there's murder and sex and you know, it's got to have all of that in their court cases and so on. What about but, your uh, time? What about your spare time? What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> Chester. Yeah. Chester, it's yeah. no one on here. I was the one that showing showing the uh, the picture. It wasn't a magazine. It was It's uh, the World Atlas of Wine the eighth edition, and you go to the page that starts with uh, Australia and New Zealand, and guess what? There's a picture of your Rubik's Cube to start it out. So it just Look shows, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm, my name is Noel McMahon, by the way, from Fev Wines, and it just shows you that Darrenberg, I know Chester is far too uh, modest to say, but uh, Darrenberg Wines is, is one of the best uh, wineries in all of Australia, and you're also part of the the uh, the twelve first families, uh, Chester. Do you want to say about that? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. So back uh, over ten years ago now, um, twelve uh, wineries scattered around Australia got together that were all uh, old family wineries. Uh, you know, many of them 150 years old, like Henschke and Yalumba, and uh, and then there's Tyrrells and Tobilk and and so forth. There's twelve of us that get together and travel around the world and and get drunk together and tell stories basically, which is quite funny. There's some very, a uh, lot of characters in amongst the group actually. And so, uh, and there's the next generation that are all coming along now of, we've been doing it for 10 years, but all the next gen are actually all now involved in their companies. And uh, my three daughters actually, uh, or two of them are studying winemaking, the other one's going to as well. So uh, uh, it's great that the fifth generation is also uh, hopping into it. But uh, yeah, the uh, that was designed that group to, uh, uh, promote wine for around the world which is a little bit tricky to do nowadays with well other than webinars I think I've done in the last year I've done uh, over a hundred webinars actually uh, virtual tasting so which has been we've been great and normally I'd travel three months so this is why I've been able to do so many sculptures and write the book that I've been wanting to write for 10 years and and all the other weird things buying another business and whatever anyway yeah, we, we're getting distracted you need to start drinking the next wine which is the uh, the lucky lizard, and you can see here the uh, the lizard sitting on a post. Uh, um, he's uh, he's laughing still because the Grim Reaper uh, missed him. Uh, basically, uh, it's called the lucky lizard because uh, the uh, the lizard's sitting on a post waiting for a fly to come along, and uh, and then they're knocked off uh, into the load of grapes, and they're they're actually quite big. They're, here's one here. Um, it's a plastic one, obviously. <laughs> they, they don't make that noise, obviously. Uh, but they are pretty flat, They're even flatter than this. Uh, well, that's mainly because they go through the rollers of the crusher and maybe have a little bit of a massage. But they come out alive. Uh, bearded dragons is what they're called. Um, and there's some really good art sculptures I've got in the building uh, relating to this. But um, so some people say now we're not adding lizards to the wine, then it hasn't got as much body because uh, we've lost the, the, all the body. But, but, you know, years ago, people used to add blood to wine, uh, ox blood to remove tannins. The protein would 
precipitate the tannins. It's illegal now, but uh, but uh, you know, a little bit of lizard blood was going in there before, which would have been making the wines lighter. So actually now the wine is actually bigger because of no lizard blood anymore. But um, yeah, it's a bit of a joke. Uh, but um, the... Uh, <laughs> The, uh, the old crusher smashed them up to bits, but it's the new crusher is more gentle. So now this is from the uh, Adelaide Hills, uh, which is the region right alongside McLaren Vale, um, to the east. Um, uh, McLaren Vale's altitude varies from sea level up to about 250 metres. Um, where Derenberg is, is around 100 to 150 for most of the vineyards. Uh, but these vineyards are around 500 metres altitude. Um, so it's you know, another three or four degrees colder, five, maybe five degrees colder. Um, and actually, uh, Sterling, where a lot of the fruit comes from, is the closest homocline to Dijon in the, in the world of places that make Pinot Noir, apparently. Um, so at same sunlight hours, the same temperature as, uh, as Burgundy. Uh, but less rainfall and uh, different sites still uh, and different latitudes. So that makes a different wine, of course. But um, also... Yeah. I use Esther, do you mind me interrupting you there just to say again, like just for the folks up in, in um, up here in the Northern Hemisphere, where, where you folks are in South Australia is equivalent to North Africa in, in our uh, Northern Hemisphere. Yeah. Uh, it just yeah. gives you a bit of perspective on that. And, and the other thing about Australia, um, is that the distance, I mean, it's an enormous country uh, and we, we in little old Ireland, uh, like Australia is, is bigger than most of Western Europe. Yeah, to yeah. give you an idea. Well, if you got, got in a car and, and drove from Perth to Brisbane, it would be like us up in the Northern Hemisphere getting in a car and driving from Madrid to Moscow. Yeah, yeah, and uh, we're bigger than the United States of America. Uh, yeah, so, well, if you've got Alaska out of it, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's a, yeah, it's a big country, and, and we often generalize vintages, which is not fair, of course, because it's uh, it's quite different uh, throughout the country. But um, uh, yeah, McLaren Vale actually uh, was the first place to be planted in South Australia in uh, 1837 uh, was when vines were planted here. So we've been making, uh, we've got a lot of old vines and there's a lot of old vines throughout Australia. In fact, the oldest, Shiraz, Mourvedre, Grenache, uh, Marsan, Chardonnay uh, in the world is all grown in Australia. Um, they're, they're still on the same roots uh, as they were uh, from the 1800s. Um, but anyway, getting, getting distracted. Um, so yeah, Adelaide Hills, um, quite cool climate, as I say. Uh, I use a clone that is uh, called G9V7, which is a quite a rare clone. It, it's um, uh, nuggety little clusters, um, has more Granny Smith apple-like characters, uh, uh, nice crunchy minerality um, and, uh, and a lovely lift uh, and elegance, it, it, but, but very long. It's more, more mineral crunchy Granny Smith apple length than the normal clone, which is 90 something percent of all clones in Australia are I10V1, which is more pineapple and a little bit broader uh, character than, uh, than this clone. Um, so it has great fruit characters as well. Uh, what, what vintage have we got there? 18, Chester, I think. 18. In fact, just as, you're, just as you're talking about the vintage, Chester, I'm just going to post up um, just so everyone knows so that they can see a link uh, for all of the retail prices of these, because this is just remarkable. And uh, and when I just look at the at the retail price of this for Chardonnays from Adelaide Hills that are available in Ireland, this is twenty four quid a bottle, and it's. Uh, We're always trying to tell people how good Australian Chardonnays mm. are. You know, they they get mixed up with all the wrong group, if you know what I mean. Uh, they there's some just well, the good ones are just wonderful. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, we we uh, we used to make or a lot of Australia, I say, I say, used to make what they called the Dolly Parton style, the sort of big, <laughs> you know, very upfront, you know, sort of style, um, a bit fat and uh, and voluptuous. Um, but uh, I, and I never made that style. In fact, you know, this is a style I've always made, and uh, so we've always prospered uh, on the wings, I suppose, in that style, and, and now selling more Chardonnay than we ever have because it, it, the people have really realised this is a style they really want to drink. Um, uh, and so uh, it, uh, 
Australia, though, right now, according to most of the media around the world, is making the best Chardonnays of the world. Uh, of course, Burgundy makes great Chardonnays, uh, as, and you would say the best in the world for sure. Um, but uh, but you know you need hundreds of dollars to uh, to, and you can get the same equivalents for a, well a, a different thing, but you know great Chardonnay for a, uh, a lot less. So um, yeah, the uh, we do uh, full barrel fermentation with this, no no uh, skin contact, just a basket breast, and uh, we keep the pressings, the last pressings out. Uh, we do solids in the fermentation, uh, about, I think probably about 15% of the solids go back in the, the top layer that is on top of the, uh, the leaves. So we, we press it, we crush it and, and uh, press it and settle out the juice. And uh, in the bottom, there'll be a foot deep of, uh, of all the solids, bits of pulp and, and whatever else that came through, skin and seed and whatever. And uh, we scoop the top part of the solids out and put that back into the barrels. And this is, uh, this is the pulp, the last part to settle, which is quite elegant. And we leave it on the pulp in the barrel with the yeast uh, through the whole life of seven months in the barrel. And that, that seems to give a better um, uh, minerality and, and, uh, and uh, better textures as well and, uh, and keep the life and fragrance. If we went a bit deeper, we do get more uh, complexity and, and some other characters, but... Um, but uh, you lose some of that beautiful passion fruit-like characters that you can so you can see in this a little bit, and uh, uh, you know the grapefruit and whatever. So it it, uh, it works out well that way. Um, uh, and then uh, there's uh, mostly one or a little bit of new, but one, two, three-year-old French oak. But I'm really particular about the oak that I use in that they're all very very low toast. In fact, lower than what low toast ever is so all of our coopers have to uh, have, we've worked with for years and and we always are pushing them the uh, the boundaries to get the lowest toast possible but you can still you've got to toast the barrel just to be able to bend the barrel uh, you've got to heat it up a little bit or else they, they snap of course uh, so they're they're, uh, they're finding ways to do this such that uh, we don't get any of the toast because i don't i don't want that uh, smokiness or the thick caramel like character or cedar like character and and, uh, and you know rich yet rich no, weird things that get in the way of the fragrant fruit characters of the middle palate and out the end of the palate as well. But I, I, I quite like a little bit of uh, sappy sort of fruity like oak, oak out the end that is not hard planky woody tannins or sawn oak sort of saw wood like characters, but just a sweet sappy little note out the end that it, that lingers. And it, and it melds extremely well with the with the minerality of the grapefruit sort of tight uh, minerality and uh, and helps to hide that minerality and and hide the oak together the two together work very well a little bit like nebbiolo from barolo uh, you know nebbiolo is quite a, a, a pretty lightweight variety that uh, that has hard acid and hard tannin uh, and so they use uh, uh, slovenian oak which is, has abundance of this sappy sweet fruity character and and, uh, and it really helps to to uh, lengthen the two things together in the same way in which this uh, the lucky lizard is doing that what do, sorry chester what do you use to find the uh, chardonnay oh uh, just bentonite um just to remove the unstable uh, proteins obviously to do that yeah, funnily enough we do do a sparkling wine uh, called pollyanna poly which is largely made from this clone uh, with some Pinot Noir and Pinot Munio, uh, and uh, non-vintage. And um, actually, that one I, I ferment with solids and, I, and all. I don't find it at all, and it never never precipitates in the bottle. It's uh, had no bentonite at all. Um, and, and actually, it's winning the uh, the best uh, uh, wine, uh, uh, non-vintage uh, sparkling wine in uh, in uh, the Adelaide Hills Wine Show now consistently, and uh, um, and is also pretty good value. So you should get onto that sometime. It's actually seven years on Eastleigh. So anyway, we're not talking about it. Well, we should we should talk about the. Uh, I think is this the next one, the Darry's original? Chester, Chester, just before you dive off onto the Darry's, and it is Darry's original is coming, and, and if, if everyone has got two glasses, which I hope at least you have, uh, you could start pouring the red. But just a couple of quick questions in from um, Jerry, wondering about uh, how you feel about un oak Chardonnay, such a kind of a Western style of um, of Chardonnay. I think I think it's far more for common in in Margaret River. Is that right? Oh, well, it happens throughout Australia, there's no doubt. Um, there was a big movement maybe in the uh, 90s probably and early late 80s 
with uh, unoaked Chardonnay. And uh, and they were they were quite nice wines, um, and they aged really well. In fact, I had a few nineties recently from a cellar of Australian uh, unoaked Chardonnays so that were looking quite good. Um, uh, but um, uh, they, it sort of fell out of favour of unoaked Chardonnay. It just what what it it was part of the reason it was unoaked is because most of the other wines were actually quite oaky. And so people didn't like the oak level often, which uh, eventually uh, winemakers worked out and don't make oaky, oaky Chardonnays that often now. So, so sort of the unoak sort of movement is, uh, is not as uh, prominent here, I suppose. People just make a Chardonnay, they don't write unoaked on it much. Although we have a, we have a uh, stump jump Chardonnay, actually is a lightly wooded Chardonnay, we call it, um, which uh, 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 doesn't have uh, all oak. And our, our uh, olive grove Chardonnay is also uh, not uh, all uh, oaked. And we have a witch's berry Chardonnay. We make, we make four Chardonnays, which is uh, witch's berry is deadly nightshade. And, uh, and uh, I, uh, uh, that, that's organic, that range, which um, you know, I don't know whether you've got the organic range yet, but it's only just come out really. Um, our, our vineyards, we have uh, uh, 500 acres of vines and um, they're nearly all uh, organic farmed and biodynamic farmed. In fact, we're the largest biodynamic grower in Australia. Um, so uh, uh, that, that's why that range came about. Um, the, um, anyway, getting back to the, the uh, Dairy's original. Um, the, so uh, yeah, that's, this is the, uh, the caricature of, uh, oh, you've got it there anyway. Oh, now. I'm uh, sorry, Jester, I shouldn't have done that. Sorry, apologies. No, 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 please do it. That, that's easier than uh, me holding it up and it probably gives okay. more information. What right. vintage have you got there? Is it 17, I, I imagine? 15. Sorry? Yeah, 15. Oh, you're on the 15. Oh, cool. Yeah. Good. Right. Amazing. Uh, yep. Yeah, so uh, that is about 50 50, uh, just slightly more Shiraz than uh, Grenache. Um, we've been making this wine for, uh, well, since the 50s, uh, well, probably before then, but selling it in bottles since the 50s. Uh, it used to be called Burgundy, and my, uh, my father um, uh, um, always made it with Grenache dominant, actually, in the 60s, and then went to, in the, in the 70s, made it more Shiraz dominant, and, uh, and, and the 80s, I suppose. I came along in the 80s, and uh, I continued the Shiraz dominant wines. And, uh, and until recently, actually, the, the, uh, 1998 was a Grenache dominant uh, Darius original. Um, uh, but, and, but now the last few vintages, the 1718, which you haven't actually got yet, uh, are, are back to being more Grenache, uh, higher levels of Grenache, which is quite interesting and fun. Uh, but um, the uh, Grenache and Shiraz are obviously extremely well suited to McLaren Vale. Uh, where Derenberg is, which is a little um, to the northern parts of the of McLaren Vale, and a little, uh, about eight kilometres inland, the whole district only extends sixteen kilometres inland, and uh, so it's obviously uh, affected by the the sea, the Gulf of Saint Vincent, um, which uh, gives a bit of a maritime influence to uh, to uh, McLaren Vale. Um, it means that our days are not quite as hot as, as you go inland and the nights are, uh, are uh, not as cold either, I suppose. Um, but we, it, it's, quite, it's quite a really interesting area because I mentioned we have the Adelaide Hills region uh, to the east of us um, and the seas to the west of us. Uh, so uh, at night time, we actually get a lot of wind from the, from the mountains. And, um, and actually, there is, uh, in summer, there's actually quite a big diurnal variation uh, even seven or eight kilometres from the sea, uh, and uh, which is which means we get more fragrance and better acidities, and we do have a bit of diurnal variation. Um, but uh, but then uh, uh, when you get to autumn, the, uh, the we start to get more influence from the sea and, and winter, and we don't have frosts or snow, and uh, and uh, we can ripen really late vintages uh, and late varieties. Uh, Easily and autumns are quite dry too. It doesn't really rain much until winter, and so so and spring we don't have the frost either. So we have a lot of benefits by having diurnal variation 
in in the hottest summer, but and and uh, a mild uh, warmer winters, so it's quite quirky. That in fact we have quite early bud bursts in uh, McLaren Vale, more early than the than the like the Riverland where it's obviously hotter and more irrigated vines. But we we uh, we bud burst a week or two before them, but we harvest weeks after them, so we have quite a relatively long growing season. And we used to say uh, well, it's the longest growing season in the world, but of course everywhere in the world vineyards is ripening earlier. Uh, nowadays, so uh, some of the uh, more obscure varieties like Aglianico and uh, and uh, uh, Deriff and um, uh, um, uh, Menthea, um, uh, these these varieties we're finding are, are very very uh, late ripening and have enormously long uh, time in in the vineyard, but they're really making some really amazing wines. Uh, and, and Montepulciano, really having fun with that as well. I think Montepulciano and Menthea are my favourite two. Uh, Nero Davler's working well too. But anyway, uh, of, of the new varieties, I'm saying, because uh, obviously Shiraz and Grenache are uh, what we've, uh, what, I, what I love a lot of too. And so a lot of really old vines. Is there a question, Will? I'm going to put a hand up there. There is one or two. Firstly, will you blend? Do you plan on blending those varieties, Montepulciano's and Nero Davler's, or would you? look to see to release those as single varietals? Oh, we've actually been doing it for a few years now, but uh, it's pretty small production. Uh, so I've got a single vineyard, uh, Menthea, uh, Nero Davila, uh, Montepulciano, um, the Aglianico I blend with Derif or uh, Petite Syrah, um, but, uh, and then the Portuguese varieties, I tend to blend together as well uh, with uh, Tempraneo, which was well, Tintoro is, and, and, uh, and Tuntacau, and uh, Cezal, and uh, Tariga Nacional, and whatever you say. So, yeah, I'm working with 37 grape varieties. Um, so uh, we are just uh, seeing, we, we don't really know in McLaren Vale whether Shiraz and Grenache, Mauved, and Cabernet were the right varieties to plant. So. Uh, we, we thought we'll give a go with some of these others, and we're really making some exciting wines with them. Um, and uh, and uh, the, because they ripen a month or two later, then it's uh, with climate change, it's a uh, it's a good a good uh, uh, I suppose uh, insurance. Um, the um, yeah, so Dairy's original um, the uh, this is obviously a relatively affordable wine, and so uh, the. Shiraz is uh, still old vine, uh, but we do a selection process. So uh, it, uh, uh, the, um, the best stuff goes to the dead arm, of course, and then the stuff that doesn't fall in there goes into here that uh, still is, uh, in fact, we could make a lot more dead arm if everyone bought a lot more of it. So, <laughs> so it ends up with uh, some pretty good material in going into these wines still. As you can see, this is still quite a, a youthful structured wine. Um, and that's our style anyway. Um, Again, the oak is all completely integrated into the wine. You don't notice uh, the oak there. Uh, and, and there's a lovely freshness and life and uh, uh, zing and, uh, and a youthful, bright tannin that is still quite uh, tight and, and uh, will take years to open up. I always say to people, uh, my reds are best uh, opened when they're eight years old, and uh, and then uh, drink. You know they'll drink for many years. Um, uh, particularly great vintages. Um, even the even these this price uh, level uh, is the same thing really. Uh, but but you can drink them obviously quite easily when they're uh, three or four anyway. Uh, um, uh, and uh, and they just got a little bit more youth talents. But the Grenache is um, all dry grown bush vines. Um, we uh, a lot of these vineyards were derelict vineyards actually. Uh, so in 1985, the government paid people to pull out vines, uh, $2,000 a hectare uh, to pull out their vines because there was a surplus of grapes. And they got the money and they uh, didn't pull out the vines because they, they thought, well, the vines would just die, just bush vines, no trellis. Um, they, uh, and the vines didn't die because Grenache is extremely hardy. It loves uh, drought conditions and, uh, and there's enough rainfall in McLaren Vale to cope with it. And the soils and geologies are quite poor, but they still, uh, still manage to survive. And, uh, and so back about eight, seven, eight years later, I started gathering up all of these derelict vineyards of Grenache, um, which uh, I ended up with 20 or 30 vineyards that hadn't been pruned. And it was these vineyards that taught me not to uh, not to cultivate, uh, not to fertilise with any nitrogenous fertilisers, and, and not to irrigate if I can, which the Grenache is not. 
and uh, and no herbicides. And so so we, we did start printing a lot of these vineyards, uh, uh, but that's about all we've done, really. A lot of them haven't been fertilised since the 70s, so, so they're still uh, just chugging out little low crops of one tonne an acre or some are less, some are a bit more. Uh, and, uh, and so... Uh, and McLaren Vale, where we are in McLaren Vale, is one degree colder than Shannoneuf to Pat. So we're uh, sort of uh, sort of halfway between Shannoneuf to Pat and Cote Roti in temperature regime. So hence Shiraz and Grenache can work. Uh, and um, some cool years, so Grenache is more really red and lighter in colour and um, uh, red fruits. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, some years it's more purple and and dark and big and concentrated. Um, 18 was um, a relatively concentrated year uh, and a relatively darker year, so they're quite big wines. There's a 17, if some of you may have had that before, and, and that was uh, a little bit more... Uh, oh, no, you're on 15, I forgot, sorry. I keep saying 18. You're actually on a six-year-old wine. So, yeah, you, no, that's good. You've actually got a bit of age. Um, and, uh, and 15 was a vintage that was um, uh, quite earthy and spicy, and relatively rich and chunky tannins. I keep talking about that, you know, because that's what we're on here. Uh, but yeah, 15 was uh, really earth-like characters and, and it needs a bit of air. It was certainly, it was the most sort of earthy vintage that we've had for some years and the, and the, and the giving them air uh, that, that blows off and the fruit just starts coming up more and more savory and spicy. And, and, uh, and again, it was relatively red fruits, Carrotton. But it's a little bit like, I don't know whether people drink Burgundy over there, but um, 2005 Burgundy was, uh, was sort of the same sort of thing, really earthy, big tannic year, uh, but that uh, that needed needs uh, needs airing. It's the only Burgundy year that I actually breathe. That uh, this is a bit funny enough, 15, uh, 10 years later, but it's sort of a similar characters. Uh, um, we, we, what have we, we got? Justin, we better get your your take very quickly on 16 because I think we've got some that have 16, and I don't know if it's just our bottle in the office is 15, but but. Um, so we got some 16 out there as well. But you say oh, eight, cool. years, eight years to get kicking on on, 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 on even this wine as well. As, as all your reds, you'd say the same? Yeah, yeah. so 16 vintage was a um, uh, also quite a tannic vintage, but quite different. The, uh, the darker fruit characters, um, um, more a uh, little bit of licorice-y, uh, mulberry-like characters and lift uh, than the earth red spectrum of the 15. Uh, and the tannins, uh, both both wines had tannins quite a lot, but the uh, 15 had spicy tannins. The 16 has a, a more this licorice like tannin that, and, uh, and a dark fruit-like lift. And and actually, I was a little bit nervous when we released the 16s that the tannins we went a little bit hard, you know, maybe a bit extracted. But uh, but that was only when they were like two, three years old. And they actually uh, really uh, came around extremely well as they uh, as they opened up. And the, the 16 should be drinking really, really, really lovely. In fact, I, I think I prefer the 16 to the 15 uh, as a vintage. Uh, and if I look back through 06 uh, and 96, 86, 76, 66, all the sixes have a, a certain similarity in their in their purple sort of character, uh, and and the, especially the eighty six, the seventy six, and the sixty six. They were very similar wines to what this vintage is like. Then O uh, six uh, was actually uh, uh, and ninety six were actually much more elegant, um, but still still a similar sort of uh, slight mint and and uh, and licorice uh, character. Yeah, so. Anyway, it's quite interesting that uh, yeah that you've got that too. Um, it's drinking really well. All right, so we better. Uh, Jeff, is it the can, can I jump in very quick because your notes right in front of you do not have stump jump bread on them, I believe, because you'd be moving on to the laughing magpie. But we do have stump jump bread here as well uh, that everyone has. So if you could give us a couple of minutes just on that before you jump to the laughing magpie, because I bet you you don't have them. You'd have put them in front of. You'd have had it in front of uh, possibly Darius, I would guess. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry. yeah. I didn't realize. I Not actually had the, I had the wrong list of wines. <laughs> yeah. So, no. yeah, you're going backwards there. I didn't realise. Uh, I, no, I think no, I had the... It's the I've only got one. Another, yeah. I've got another webinar coming up, and I had, uh, I had, the, uh, I had the wrong list of wines up. So, anyway, here's the, uh, here's the stump uh, uh, representing the, uh, the stump jump. 
uh, and you notice that it's a, an eye chart, the label's a seeing eye chart, and um, uh, that's uh, a sobriety test. So if you hold it at arm's length uh, and you can read the little letters at the bottom, then you can have another glass. As, uh, of course, it's pretty easy to cheat. Uh, and, uh, and then you can drink for a fair while until you really, really can't talk. And that's actually when you're supposed to stop drinking. Don't, don't use it for operating heavy machinery or cars and things like that. Yeah. But uh, th this obviously gets the, um, all of the, uh, all the stuff that didn't fit into all the other wines and uh, uh, still McLaren Vale. Yeah. Was it Shiraz or was it the GSM? I didn't see the bottom of the label. Yeah. GSM. Yeah. GSM. Yes. So still old vine, dry grown Grenache, and it will be 2017, I'm pretty sure. We've been on that vintage for quite a while. Um, uh, and you know, a little bit softer than the dairies, a little bit more uh, open, uh, but still with substantial tannins for a wine, uh, uh, this uh, caliber. In fact, I see um, the wine spectator yesterday gave this uh, Best Buy and uh, gave it 91 points, which uh, I thought was nice and generous of them. Um, but uh, yeah, but anyway, it, it's uh, yeah, it, it's uh, for for a, a relatively affordable wine. Uh, we it's still made with the uh, with the same technology with basket pressing and everything else, uh, and uh, small fermenters. So yeah, it, uh, it it's still got a fair bit of love in there. Um, so moving right along to the uh, the uh, laughing magpie, which you can see here. Um, so there they are, the uh, magpie and the, <laughs> laughing at the bill, the price of the bill. Um, so uh, it's called the laughing magpie because uh, my daughter, when she was three years old, she couldn't say kookaburra. And so uh, she called them laughing magpies. And uh, a magpie is black and white. Here, well, I've got one here. Um, of course, uh, there's black and white grapes in this wine, those in Shiraz and Viognier. Um, and uh, it's a very cheerful wine with great fragrance and lift and uh, a very uh, uh, lovely colour and brightness so, so it, uh, and length. So it, it's, it is a laughing magpie, effectively. But, but of course, as I mentioned, it's the kookaburra. Or as I'll show you the backside of him. Here you see some front, front, front part. That's, that's what a kookaburra looks like, uh, more or less, although it's a little bit shabby. This one's been around the world over a thousand times. <laughs> That's the noise. Well, that's the sort of noise they make. This battery's getting a bit flat, and this one sounds like it's been taken over uh, by demons, um, which is actually quite appropriate because my daughters now are uh, late teenagers or a bit more, and have been also been uh, uh, taken over by uh, possessed by something. I think sometimes. Uh, anyway, no, they're beautiful girls actually. But uh, the um, now, uh, we started making this wine because we were we had the football Shiraz, which is our biggest selling red we make, um, and, and the dairies, of course, for us, similar level quality Shiraz. And we had the dead arm, which is quite a bit more expensive. And we were turning many of the really old vine vineyards into old vine Shiraz, uh, into beautiful old vine Shiraz that, that really could have been going into dead arm. So we went, well, um, we, uh, we, it's not very affordable to get one ton an acre and, and sell it at uh, Darry's price. So we thought we'd come up with a wine in between. I had so much Viognia, I went, well, that's a good idea. I can, uh, I can use the Viognia uh, in this. And so we started doing this in 1998 and we instantly won uh, trophies uh, with the first vintage and, uh, and, uh, and ever since then have won a lot of acclaim. And it's become, uh, everyone joined the bandwagon in Australia and, and later Shiraz Viognia, and then they all, they all stuffed it up. They all just added a bit of white wine to it or just fermented with some average Viognia and average Shiraz. But you've really got to use pretty high quality Shiraz. Um, and uh, I... I uh, Again, I don't pick too ripe with the Shiraz. I, uh, I don't want to see any shrivel. If there's any shrivel in there, I pick straight away uh, because that'll make the wine go a little bit old and, and jammy as it gets mature and, and you know, old sweaty socks and whatever. Uh, but, um, or soya sauce things, you know. But, uh, but uh, I want to have that really nice, spicy, fragrant character in there. Um, what we do is we, we actually press the Viognia um, once and remove about uh, two thirds of the juice for the uh, hermit crab 
and then those skins uh, with still one third of the juice in them go into the Shiraz uh, uh, fermenter, five ton fermenters, um, with the Shiraz uh, uh, crushing uh, at the same time. And we do this at about 15% Viognier uh, when we do the fermentation. Um, and so it has a, an abundance of Viognier. When it's a year old, I go through and I select all the best barrels for, for this wine. Well, although I have one uh, now, it's $200 a bottle as a bit of Shiraz Viognier in there. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so, uh, I get, get all the best barrels. And then we blend uh, Shiraz back in the material that was destined for dead arm, but uh, was, uh, uh, didn't quite work out. It was either you know, too chunky or a little bit more elegant or whatever. Uh, and, that, and that goes into this one to bring the Viognier level down to somewhere between uh, five and 10%. Uh, in fact, the lowest one is 4%, I think I've made, uh, which is actually, uh, I think the uh, 16 vintage. Uh, um, if I remember rightly. Uh, what, what vintage have you got there? 16, isn't it? It is, yeah, 16. And is it, say, 4% on the back label? Have I got that right? Um, yeah, I think uh, you are right, yeah, because it actually said, yeah, it's, it's 96 and 4, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so, uh, uh, yeah, because obviously the, uh, the Viognier was quite strong in 2016, and, uh, and I didn't want it to be overbearing, and, and, uh, and I managed, and I found that the straight Shiraz was so much good Shiraz that I just I thought we'll put a bit more Shiraz in it. So, so that's where we ended up with it, basically. So it's only been in oak for, uh, well, the Shiraz Viognier for only a year. The actual um, uh, Shiraz was in oak for um, uh, up to about 18 months, I suppose, and uh, so uh, uh, a little bit longer. Um, all, all, everything in oak is actually left on the leaves. So the submerged cap ferments are um, with, the, with the raft that you saw before, in, that you can pull it up again if you want, uh, the, the raft holds the skins down. So at the beginning of fermentation, there's all whole berries five foot deep. Uh, and as they start fermenting slowly, because we start quite cold, the, uh, the uh, berries are being squashed. The, uh, the, um, the, uh, the uh, CO2 trying to get out is pushing up, so keep going a little bit further. Yeah, okay. A little bit further. Um, uh, a little bit further. Oh. There we are. We're getting there now. Yeah. So that, that's the... Uh, there we are. That's, that's the submerged cap. This is to, uh, when we're draining off, actually. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so one further down where you were basically. And, and then uh, gradually over five or six days, um, or maybe eight days, the, the skin squashed slowly and the juice oozes out through the cap, solvently extracting the flavor. We don't do any plunging. Uh, so, and we're not jetting you know, with a pump, you know, to break up the skin. So it's quite a low amount of solids actually. And, um, and the, um, uh, then, then we, we have in place cooling. Uh, so if you go to the next photo, you can see uh, the guy in there. Uh, in fact, uh, you can see him foot treading, um, uh, and then uh, which we do uh, about two thirds of the way through after we've cooled the ferment down. You can see um, oh, there was a cooling call, and the next and the next photo actually has uh, you can see the fermenters all lined up. But we foot tread once through the ferment to uh, cool the skins down. So there you can see all the cooling calls on the left uh, uh, hanging up and, uh, and they lower down into the fermenter where there's juice all on the top but we cool that juice down. We have little pumps in the corner that we can circulate the fermenter. Um, and, um, and so uh, we have a cool end of the ferment uh, to keep the fragrance there and, and uh, less fatness and broadness and, and a finer fragrant tannin. Um, Although with the new crusher in 2009, I bought a new crusher, which is a, a, a Velo crusher, and uh, it's even softer than the Demoisey crusher, which we had, which was considered years ago the softest crusher in the world. But the, with, with this Velo is even softer, and I found that I can leave skins in, in contact with the, skin, the juice for an extra 15% time longer to get the same amount of tannins, and the tannins I'm getting are more of the skin tannin, less of the seed or broken stalk. And, uh, and so we found that we can get a little bit more heat into the ferment at the end now uh, and not, and not uh, sacrifice any uh, negative tannins. So it's, uh, it's been uh, uh, quite interesting how that's been a really advantageous uh, change of equipment that we've done. Um, so, so the solids are quite a low amount of solids. So the basket press, as the juice washes out through those holes, it's filtered by all of the water of skins. And the, the solids are actually quite a low amount of solids. 
and uh, and so you can see them there. So so um, the uh, uh, or there, <coughs> and the the low amount of solids um, means uh, that it's really only just a bit of pulp and a bit of yeast in the barrel, and so it's a thin layer of a few millimeters. So if it was a thicker layer, you you start getting um, a real uh, uh, um, uh, sort of vegetative rotting meaty sort of character which is really can be a bit off putting uh, uh like stewed vegetable too uh, but with a thin layer you get uh, more minerality because it's a pulp uh giving more length uh, and the yeast scavenging oxygen so you're giving more freshness and a little bit of reduction just the tiniest little bit which which i don't mind because it keeps the length of the wine there and and uh and it blows off very quickly anyway i'm gonna have to have a drink of water because i'm losing my voice There we are. Um, Was it, Chester, you yeah. take, take, take a breath, right, and, 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 and have, have some more water, right? But Because it's probably a perfect chance. Like, we're, we're, we're more than halfway through the wine. So does anyone have any questions or want to dive in and, uh, and ask anything at all? Uh, feel free, uh, to, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Will, Will can, I, can I ask a question? Please, Jay, yeah. Yeah. Um, Chester, it's been a fabulous evening. You've given us a huge amount of information. I met you before in both London and Dublin. And I've always admired what you're doing and what you've achieved. I have one question, though, in relation to the alcohol level that we've all seen increase over the last number of years, particularly in relation to red wines, not just in Australia, but globally. And I'm wondering, is this something you seek to achieve as a winemaker for the balance of the wine or has it anything to do with the extra sugars that are generated due to global warming, increased temperatures, etc. Yeah, I think a lot of people uh, caught out at vintage time with the harvest ripening a month earlier, then um, you know, sugar levels can change quite quickly with a heat wave. And a lot of people get caught out. A lot of people say that they need to leave the grapes on the vine longer to, um, uh, to get phenolic ripeness, they often say. Uh, but, but really, um, th there's too much emphasis put on that, and I think that's a, it's exaggeration. Uh, well, it, it, can mean, it can be right when, if you're using fertilizer, if you've got a nitrogenous fertilizer, then the vine will um, uh, be more vegetative, even when it's getting nearly right, there'll be still a mintiness or an herbalness that you want to get out of. But if you're not adding nitrogenous fertilizers, then you don't have that issue happen, and you can pick a little earlier. Um, but uh, uh, even though um, my, my wines are normally somewhere around 14, 14 and a half percent alcohol, um, they haven't really changed since the 80s. In fact, even, even if you look back in the 70s and the 60s, the, uh, the measurement they often say on the label like 13 and a half, but actually the, the, the measure they used was an ebulliometer we used, and that's actually always reads one degree alcohol less than what the uh, the uh, uh, pignometry, which is the recognised uh, style of measuring alcohol now, uh, and so they were actually they were pretty much the same alcohol level in the 50s and 60s. But there are people who like to go over uh, over 15, or even Bordeaux. You know, 2009, the average alcohol content was 14.9, apparently, um, of Bordeaux. So, uh, but uh, you know, and, and they're having their moments of heat. Obviously, we would have heard over the years. So, so we're all we're all uh, combating that. Well, Bordeaux, of course, has now got all these other new varieties that they're adding. So, but um, but uh, I, I don't have a problem as long as the wine doesn't look hot, as long as there's enough minerality and fragrant length uh, to cope with that amount of alcohol, and, the, and it's not too fat and broad because the, the alcohol does add weight to the wine. Um, then uh, then uh, you know, as long as the balance is right, is really what it comes down to. And, and very rarely would you find a Barolo under 14% alcohol mm. um, because they would be uh, thinner and, and hard and, and yeah. uh, really quite attractive. So uh, I work with the same philosophy with our wines. Yeah, I, th I think quite obviously the balance in the wines, certainly in, the, in these big grape varieties is perfect. But have you any concerns into the future with their, I say, global warming, increased temperatures? Is that going to cause any problems? In, in as, as a wine producer? 
I, I, I wouldn't even have to say into the future. I'd say right now. Yeah. Um, we last year we had a horrible vintage. We had uh, November was quite cold and quite hot. So we had really cold weather followed by 40 something degrees uh, and back to really cold weather in, in within a week or so, you know, between each, uh, which is very you know, extreme. And it really upset uh, the, uh, the setting of many varieties. Yeah. It, 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 enough some of these european varieties uh, southern italian and, and uh, hot spanish varieties had no problem but uh, but yeah so it, it, the french varieties you know did suffer from that so we're already that's just one example uh, so yeah that's why we're working with so many other varieties um, sure 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 I yeah found, i found my i found my father here, here he is, uh, <laughs> It's a, a, a broken bobblehead because it's traveled around the world too much. He, he's off his face and he's got dead arm and he's legless as well, really. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Thanks, Chester. Thank you. Yeah, cheers. Um, uh, so, yeah, is there Hi. any other questions? Copper mine is where we are next, Chester. I have, uh, I have a slide cool. you'd like, or else if you've got another prop, uh, I think you're keeping everyone very entertained with the props. So, uh, oh, yeah. Props. Oh, this is one of my favourite ones here. Um, this is a, a little box um, with tooth. This is the wild pixie we have. Uh, so I've got toothpicks and an ecstasy tablet. Pix E um, gets stolen often when I travel around the world. There's another little box here which is uh, sticks and stones because which is a, 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 a Portuguese mix of varieties, so uh, and the rhyme six of stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Um, uh, we've got one here for the uh, oh no, that's not copper. That's uh, this is uh, the bamboo scrub, another one. This is the uh, the uh, copper mine road, uh, of course, which is the wine you're about to have, and uh, and there's the uh, the caricature of the copper mine road. Um, uh, uh, Mona Lisa been uh, uh, door door wizened, I suppose you could almost call it or rearranged. Um, now, uh, with Cabernet, Cabernet is an interesting thing in McLaren Vale. Not many people realise that uh, back in 1990 and before, Cabernet was considered to be the top variety of McLaren Vale. It was the same amount of plantings as there was for us. Uh, it was the most expensive grape to buy, and the most expensive wines to buy were Cabernet. And, and so um, uh, you, the boom, export boom, everyone wanted Shiraz because there's plenty of Cabernet around the world from Bordeaux and other places. So, so they wanted Shiraz. So that's actually why Shiraz boomed and Cabernet didn't. But actually, we make great Cabernets. Uh, and, uh, and you can see this wine's got a lot, to, a lot, of, a lot going, going on in it. This is made from a nearly extinct clone of Cabernet that never yields more than uh, one tonne an acre. Very, uh, very yeah. poor setting. Uh, it's, it hasn't got a name. It's the parent of the Renel clone, um, and uh, it, uh, it has a better pH, better, slightly better acidity than all the other clones. But more importantly, it has a more uh, Cabernet character and more tannin than than all the other clones, and more more fragrant length. And but in, in Cabernet Macarena, you always still get a nice bit of leafy note, so a little bit of green bean sort of character in there. Uh, and uh, depending on what vintage, what, what's the vintage you've got there? 17. So 17 was a really cool vintage. Uh, it was as cool in the sense that uh, it was one month after normal harvest. So this is more like the the, uh, the wines we were making probably back in the 80s and 70s. Uh, it was to how when it ripened. Uh, and uh, and uh, the uh, it was more red spectrum, so less mint and more capsicum uh, spectrum in that particular vintage. But uh, and the tannins uh, were a little bit more uh, tamed in that vintage as well. Um, and so, uh, uh, but it's still a very very youthful wine. And you know, the, the cabernets of the of the nineteen sixties uh, are still drinking beautifully because cabernet ages, of course, a very very long time. Um, we also not fertilizing get this beautiful earth character in amongst there. There's always a, a 
a, a dark sort of earthy uh, soot like character in McLaren Vale uh, uh, um, uh, Cabernet and a little bit of chocolate. When, whereas to the north of Adelaide, it's much more chocolate and uh, and uh, and less about mint and and, and fragrance and, and austerity. Uh, we have nice austere uh, length in uh, Cabernet. Yeah, I suppose. Not the coastal thing, Chester. Is it obviously it, it, it gets warmer far, farther inland you go? Uh, it gets yeah exactly. Um, uh, well, it, for McLaren Vale, um, it gets a hotter days but, uh, and colder nights, so it ends up being the same temperature, but you're only talking 16 kilometres in there. And then you go more inland and you get the Adelaide Hills region, which is colder because it's much higher altitude. And then as you go, it doesn't, you don't have to go too far further and it starts getting quite a bit hotter. Uh, and of course, uh, Bross Valley is to the north of Adelaide and inland, um, and Clare's even more north again. Um, uh, so that, that's they're, they're they're still further away from the sea than we are, but they're not like the, the main inland irrigated areas. Okay, and can I ask on Copper Mine Road? Um, there is another couple of questions that have come in that I have to ask, but another selfish one on my part: where you see the optimal for this wine drinking? So we're seventy; it's only four years, and it's a baby. Um, yeah, yeah. Where, where, how, how far does it? Where does this go to? I mean, how, sky's the limit. Well, well, I, I like to start drinking them when they're about eight. I say that with all of our reds because it's a lo very nice, loose sort of thing to say. You can obviously drink it now, but, but eight, I think they're really, really starting to perform in a beautiful spot. And then the better vintages, you'll get 40, 50 years out of them if, if you're going to be alive. You know? yeah, but, uh, <laughs> <That's the time. laughs> uh, won't be my... In uh, uh, in forty years' time, I'll be older than my father is right now, and he uh, he's he's had a more pure life than I have. Although you know, I don't know whether you call drinking more was pure or impure, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, question, Chester, in from uh, Owen, I think it is on um, sparkling Shirazes. He had yours, I think. Did he say? And uh, is it Peppermint Creek? Did he say uh, Peppermint Paddock? Sorry, um, years back. But he 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 asked a great question about how. Um, um, do you have any thoughts on why sparkling Shiraz is not so popular or just isn't even really a thing outside of Australia? Or certainly in yeah. Europe, it's not. Um, it is a lovely wine. It's a big wine. In fact, the best sparkling Shiraz is made from the best Shiraz. Right? It obviously sort of goes without saying much, but you need the biggest, really the best dead arm material, grange, hermitage, whatever you want to call it, material, um, is the best for making sparkling Shiraz. And that that's not really very competitive because, you know, not many people are going to go and spend $80, 100 or Eight hundred dollars on a on a bottle of uh, of uh, sparkling Shiraz, so so that tends to often be a little bit lighter stuff, but it's still a lovely drink. It's just the unusual drink, I think, is why it doesn't catch on around the world so much. We actually use Chambersen in ours and Graciano. Um, that Chambersen, a hybrid variety from the south of France, is what we the main variety that we use, and it's a very purple grape and with high tannin and high acidity, so it, make, it makes a really good sparkling wine. And uh, we call it the peppermint paddock, uh, so because uh, the peppermint gum trees actually there. Okay. And another yeah. question in from, uh, I don't know who's asking us this one, but um, but does does all of your Cabernets, this single vineyard Cabernet, the, the question is actually, um, if there's any Cabernet that doesn't make the grade for Copper Vine Road, do you downgrade that into any other blends? Or do, is this single vineyard that all stays in this in this bottle? So we have seven vineyards of this clone uh, and uh, only the best barrels of the best vineyards make its way into this. And then we have a Bordeaux blend uh, called the Galvo Garage. And I've got, I've got a little Galvo Garage here. Um, there's a door. There's a door there somewhere. There we are. Uh, uh, some people might call it the art, the out house or the dunny, but uh, it's like a little galvanized garage. Um, and um, uh, it's named after the garage east in Bordeaux uh, because uh, uh, we make our wines like the garage east, as in small batch, foot trod, you know, barrel fermented, aged on lees, you know, no filtering, no fining, and so similar process. But and we blend uh, Merlot and Petit Verdot and Cabernet Franc into it as well, so it's a Bordeaux blend. So that, that goes into there, and if it doesn't go into there, it goes into the high trellis, which is uh, a little bit cheaper. 
and I've got the, a piece of wire here for the uh, off the trellis for the uh, the high trellis, which is uh, planted in 1880. There's another. I've got another wine here. This is the uh, the biophilic Silurian. So uh, some of you might be Doctor Who fans. Uh, and the Silurians were uh, the people who came out, the lizard people came out from the centre of the world that had been hiding away for 50 or 100 million years. And that's uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, Silurian hypothesis. And we've got a vineyard of Cinso that's 70 years old that no one really knew was there. And, uh, and so uh, we bought it uh, you know, 15 years ago, but uh, no one sort of knew it was there. Um, I've got some olive, olive grove, tin of olives here for the olive grove. I've got a, uh, this is a, um, a little uh, bottle opener, obviously, uh, and this is the Noble Britannia Fucalinia, um, uh, which is uh, the, the, uh, the, word, the word that Goglik Fuckel, German man, called the mold that attacked grapes, uh, Britannia Fucalinia, and uh, um, the French called it Britannia Scenaria, and Britannia Scenaria stuck, but the original name was, was this name. And if you shorten the words noble Botrytinia Fucalinia, so the first three letters you get knob bot fuck, but you know, that's a bit rude. But, um, I did mention the witch's berry there, um, and uh, the dry dam. I've got a mouth dam for uh, you know in the, in the dentist. Nostalgia. I've got Bex. Some of you may remember Bex. Uh, it's uh, like uh, not tonight, Dale. I've got a headache. Um, and um, the uh, uh, conscious biosphere, which I talked about before. This is one of my favorite uh, ones here, which is, um, uh, this is our rosé uh, called uh, Stephanie the Known with, uh, with rose colored glasses. <laughs> and um, so th this is a lovely rosé, but the first year I made it was in 2011 and it was the highest altitude vineyard in South Australia and it was a wet year. And uh, I picked it a bit early before the retritus got it uh, and foot trod it the whole time. But it came out rosé coloured, but with a bit of structure and was, was uh, like a dark rosé. So it was, it was um, very much like a light burgundy, like a Savigny Le Bone. But instead of Savigny Le Bone, I call it Stephanie the Gnome because uh, it just rhymed. And, uh, and with rose coloured glasses, because I added Cinso and Mourvedre Rosé to it. Um, and when you drink a bottle of this wine, life's like looking through rose-coloured glasses, of course. But but if you look back over the years, a uh, hundred years, oh no, not even hundred, sorry, twenty years ago, in Australia, uh, real men uh, wouldn't be caught dead drinking rosé. So uh, uh, this pays homage to the fact that a, a gnome is a little bearded man, and uh, Stephanie's a girl's name. So this is a transsexual wine. Um, uh, but now we're all very comfortable now about our sexuality and, uh, and we're fine with drinking rosé in Australia. And I, I know you guys, well, you're all into rosé in an enormous way over there. But uh, so you should hop into this wine. It's uh, where I don't know whether Ferb's got it over there, but it's really, really lovely wine. And it's in our organic range as well. Not yet, but the summer's coming, Chester. So I think there's, uh, there's time enough. I think Noel, take notes. And, and I know Mike is on there and Liz is on there. So. Uh, let, let's get some, uh, I can't even pronounce, Stephanie the Gnome with rose tinted glasses. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie. <laughs> It'll, uh, yeah, that'll go yeah. that'll good this summer, Chester. That'll go good. <laughs> Have you got a dead arm? Is, is the last yeah. one the dead arm? So we, uh, yeah, sure, look, you, you show them, show them actually just to what everyone, everyone has a glass, Chester, and that because of the, the, the bottles that you guys gave us, um, everyone has a glass of this decanted a few days prior so that there's going to be a lovely little bit of air into this, um, and um, yeah, we're we're all pretty excited. I think about this, aren't we? Absolutely. It's like it's a wine that not everybody has ever tried. <laughs> cool. So you can see the little uh, the uh, the guy wandering around with the uh, with the arm there, and there's also uh, this uh, this is the whole cartoon of the uh, of the dead arm uh, as he goes off and gets his gets filled up and gets fixed up with his dead arm. Uh, of course, it's actually named the dead arm. Because when you drink too much of this wine, you'll pass out, wake up lying on your arm, and it will be numb, and you won't be able to move. Uh, well, that's that's actually half the reason. The other half is because uh, the eutopa uh, fungus in the vineyard gets into the pruning cuts, old, bigger pruning cuts, and kills off slowly the arm of the vine, leaving only half of the vine alive. And so all the roots are still all there, working on just a little part of the vine and a smaller amount of crop. And, uh, and so uh, it stresses less, 
it uh, gets more geology character and uh, and uh, uh, yeah, more more concentration. So so that's why we call it the dead arm, which uh, most people uh, find rather odd. Uh, apparently, this is Putin's uh, favourite wine. Um, uh, uh, I used to think it's because he's got good taste, but then I think actually what I worked out in the end is because it's got dead in the name or something. But uh, <laughs> but, uh, I don't know, but, uh, but um, the um, yeah, so we've been making this since, uh, well, we've been making Shiraz for years, of course, but we called it Dead Arm uh, for the best barrels at the best vineyards from 1993. And uh, it's 100% Shiraz. Um, about 15% of this wine comes from vines that are about 25 years old. And they will they have to be very good vineyards to be young and go in there. And they're, they're uh, spicy, gritty, lovely, lively uh, vineyards with great vibrant tannins. Uh, then there's 50% uh, from vines that are 50 or 60 years old. And uh, they'll be more earthy, more rustic, and more uh, interesting complexity from the geology underneath the soil. And then uh, about 35% from vines that are... 100 years old up to 120 something years old and they'll be really quite exotic wines that have all sorts of crazy things uh, from down deep uh, uh, from the geology so sometimes it'll be irony sooty sometimes it'll be like woody uh, sometimes like peat somewhat like sometimes chocolate even passion fruit i've found in one 110 year old vineyard that keeps popping up this passion fruit character and uh, and so yeah, they're all they're all unique. We do we do single vineyard wines of which are all components of the dead arm. There's uh, there's up to twenty of them, and uh, and they give you uh, uh, all the whole story about what, uh, what all the components of the dead arm. Usually there's only about twelve that make it in each year, uh, but because uh, some years are suitable, some vineyards will go in some years and not in other years, and then there's other vineyards that always go in. So, uh, but uh, this is are you on the seventeen? I imagine. Yeah. This is the. Yep. This is your gold medal winner, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, um, seventeen again, as I mentioned, cool vintage. So this is actually the most elegant uh, dead arm that I've ever made. Um, and uh, but uh, I, I love it a lot because uh, it's so perfumed. It's got such a beautiful fennel spice lift. I mean, hopefully it's holding up from uh, from being decanted yeah. and uh, and really long, fragrant, spicy fennel like length, which is why it won the trophy in London for the best. Um, uh, wine uh, uh, in, in the show. In fact, it won four trophies uh, in there for the best of region, best of variety, and whatever else, uh, which I, I was quite happy about. Uh, but uh, even though it's it's relatively elegant, it's still not. You know, it's just relative to our wines that we make. It's still very youthful and and will live for many years. And it has a, that classic. McLaren Vale sort of earthy, sweet, spiced character um, that, uh, that you see in the, uh, the old wines. It seems to grow in, in strength as the wine opens up more and more and more. We found that uh, we, we wanted to put them in smaller bottles and leave a lot of air in the, um, in the top just to actually bring it on a little bit because it was it's such a big wine. It needs that air, I think. Yeah, okay. Uh, 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 you're pretty gutsy. Um, we, whenever we put it into little bottles, we prefer to fill them right and uh, and to gas the bottles first uh, if it's going to be a couple of days. But uh, but yeah, I don't know. I haven't I haven't done it with this wine uh, um, the the way you're doing to see whether it's helped it or not. But um, if, if anyone wants to try it fresh, then uh, you have to buy a bottle, and so that's probably a good idea. <laughs> Surely a case, Chester. Um... <laughs> Well, because you're going to drink it over 40 years and, yeah, yeah, and exactly. get it ready for your kids. Yeah. We talked about the peppermint paddock, so I've got some peppermints here, of course, which is only one left because I rate it all the time. I've got uh, a ball here. We have a wine called Sisphenic Euphoria. The Sisyphus had to roll the boulder up the hill uh, for his penance and so uh, and euphoria. So Sisphenic means endless euphoria, so that's what we're talking about. I've got uh, the Eight Iron is another wine we make. Uh, the Garden of Extraordinary Delights, another another wine. Um, the Twenty Eight Road Movedra, piece of road. Uh, a fruit bat, um, another one. Oh, this is the uh, the Arthur Zagoraphobic Cat, or the Cenocilicophobic Cat, um, and uh, Arthur Zagoraphobia is the fear of being forgotten. And I had a cat called uh, uh, Audrey Hepburn. And Audrey was just an ordinary tabby 
uh, and I called her Audrey instead of Audrey, and so she had a complex of being forgotten. So here she is being uh, showing that she doesn't want to be forgotten, and that's the pressings of Sagrantino that we make that one with. I've got the noble prankster here, which is uh, grow your own boobs, um, put them into water, and they expand up. Oh, this is um, this is another single vineyard wine um, uh, called the Solipsic Snollygoster. Uh, you might recognise this person. Uh, this is uh, Julia Gillard, the ex-Prime Minister of Australia. Um, and uh, snollygosters are actually people who are always right and don't take anyone else's opinion into account. So all politicians, effectively. Uh, and so it's just one I could find. She's actually a dog's toy. Uh, she did tell a few porky pies, of course. And uh, yeah, so it's just quite lifelike. We have, I have a wine called the Feral Fox, a Pinot Noir, which actually... Again, the 19 vintage of this is amazing. It's uh, uh, winning medals everywhere. It's got beautiful elegance and pur purpleness and, and fragrant length. Uh, uh, and it's Adelaide Hills high altitude uh, Pinot. Um, and the real name is the funky farting feral fox because the Khaleesi virus killed all the rabbits and the foxes are turned vegetarian and eating all the grapes. So I have a whooping cushion up the backside of the, uh, of the, uh, the fox there to, to represent that. Amaranthine, the colour purple, um, uh, oh, the uh, the football uh, wine uh, with toilet roll holder. Doesn't mean the football gives you the shits, unless maybe you drink too much of it. Um, Love grass, another wine that we've got, obviously. Uh, and look, I'm running out of things. There's probably is um, this is obviously one that you can recognise the uh, the dead arm, uh, and this is the money spider Rusan. And when, when this used to work, the motor in it, you put the spider on the, the dead arm and, uh, and it would crawl along the ground and go, ah, help me, help me, which is great. It represents uh, Rusan, the white roan, northern roan variety that is attacking the red roan Shiraz variety that's been here for 200 years and he's been here for 20 something years. So it's sort of quite, uh, quite an energy. Uh, uh, and, oh, and, oh, and there's a broken fish plate off the harvester as well, spin on block. Uh, and here's another one. The, uh, uh, we have a wine called um, the. Uh, Thai cheese mustard, so uh, mustard, and uh, there's mustard weed in the vineyard, it's a very tannic vineyard, and Thai cheese, the goddess of fortune, so I've got some coins in there. Chester, uh, well. I, Chester I've never seen so many questions in the <laughs> chat, okay, they are, like, it, it, this is hopping up, it's lighting up here. How many wines is the last question that just came in? There's, how Se many? 76, but we've got a couple more coming out this year. Well, that's no surprise whatsoever. <laughs> Um, phenomenal. Okay, so 76. You were 72 when I last read, and I saw an article earlier in the week that had 60, and I don't think that was all that long ago either. So you're certainly adding more all the time to uh, the collection. There's there's a heap of questions. Firstly, what I should say is um, there is a very special lady on with us tonight, uh, Mwiran O'Leary Chester. She's uh, she's a really good customer of ours. She's a, a friend of ours, I should say, for a long, long, long time. And she's actually celebrating her, her big birthday this evening with, uh, with family in three different locations. And they're all on tonight and they're all tasting your wines together. So uh, so you must, everyone else on the chat has said happy birthday to her. So I, uh, Im, I, I, I implore you to do the same if you would say happy birthday to her. Yeah, happy birthday. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, yeah, drink up. Thank you. <laughs> Um, thank you. I mean, the chat is just, it's, it's, it's been hopping with uh, how many awards and things you've won and the people are talking of their visits there. And from your comments earlier, it seems like you run a tourism operation rather than a winery and rather than being a winemaker with half a million a year coming to the vineyard. Um, it's, it's staggering all the things you've been up to and uh, how busy you seem to keep yourself um, and how you still manage to come up with all those new names after 76 wines. Well, we it's... reckon there's more than one you. Is that true? There's some <laughs> words going around that there was more, more than one you. More than one new. More than one you. More than one Chester. More than oh, one. Well, there is. There's you have a traveling one... Chester and you have a stay at home Chester, a writing Chester and a drawing Chester. <laughs> there's, there's, a, uh, there's another one here, um, little bobblehead. Uh, and these are all over America. And I tell everyone who's got one that they are telepathically connected to me. So don't do anything in the office that you shouldn't be doing, like you know, sleeping with a with a secretary or whatever, because it'll come out. You know, 
but uh, um, but uh, or don't discuss pricing or anything in it. But uh, um, but uh, there, there is actually in the Derenberg Cube a mannequin of me and my father standing there, and uh, uh, people get really quite upset by it because they're often in walking around the room going, "Why is that person staring at me over there?" <laughs> but I, I always say, "Well, that's the one you get more sense out of, actually." <laughs> <laughs> well, b before we let you get off, Chester, to do your other webinar and everything else you need to do, uh, I, 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 I absolutely need to uh, recognise the, the effort that everyone in FEV put in. And Noel, I don't know if you want to say a final couple of words to Chester as well before, uh, be before, um, before we sign off shortly. Yeah, absolutely. Delighted. Um, on behalf of FEV Wines to thank Chester, uh, you've been a great addition to, uh, to the FEV portfolio and uh, uh, we've just had such a wonderful ride with you all through the years. I, I was reminding Chester um, on email yesterday that uh, we did a, Fev did a, a tasting in the Marina Hotel about uh, four or five years ago before this COVID pandemic hit us all. And it was um, a, a webinar involving uh, um, Hervé Robert from Maison de las Frères in the Rhone Valley uh, matched up against wines from, from Darenberg. So, uh, Chester, you were you were very much ahead of your time doing doing webinars back in back four or five years ago. So uh, it's great to see you doing it again this year, and it'd be lovely to get over to you in in Australia. So, so uh, because that'd be a lovely thing to do. Uh, because you, and in particular, going to see the Rubik's Cube is is uh, would be would, it, would be an absolute treat. You're the, the Darnberg Cube, I call it. But yeah, no, <laughs> you're right. But uh, yeah, look, uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, working with you guys you're always uh, amazing every time i talk to you and uh, and your enthusiasm but also uh, lovely people and uh, when i'm over there it's uh, i never never there long enough i always uh, enjoy mm. ireland you know the Darenberg name is actually irish believe it or not um it uh, we're uh, my great ancestors um, back in around Napoleon's time in uh, in uh, Europe, apparently uh, uh, well, a maid slept with um, one of the Arenbergs and had a uh, bastard son of Arenberg. Um, he grew up and um, was a bit of a drunk and was forced to marry one of Napoleon's nieces. And he never consummated the marriage for a year, but he's married to her probably because she looked like Napoleon. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> and then, Anyway, he, uh, he uh, challenged the rightful heir of the throne of Arenberg to a duel, shot him and killed him and fled to Ireland and, uh, uh, with the name of Abbott Hauser as his surname. And uh, he became professor of languages at Trinity College Dublin. Uh, and uh, and then uh, had a couple of kids and became the vicar and he's uh, he was the vicar of Wicklow actually, uh, uh, but uh, he um, anyway the kids named themselves Darrenberg and came to Australia and that was my grandmother's maiden name, and my father's middle name my middle name and and whatever so it's the Darrenberg name but you know the the red stripe goes uh, on one way on the label. The opposite direction red stripe is the royal stripe. We've actually got the bar sinister stripe to prove that we're from a big long line of bastards, basically. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, look, uh, I should leave you with that. And, uh, and thank you very much, everyone, for joining in. And I'll see you either over there or here sometime. Brilliant, Blake. Thank, thank you so you. much, Chester. From all of us. Thank you so much. much. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Okay, it was great. <laughs> All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Cheers. Bye bye. Happy birthday, Marin. Happy Come birthday, on. Tony. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> the big T. <tea. laughs>